can I just say, the first line of the opening crawl, Star Wars, been gone for like a decade. The Force Awakens, Luke Skywalker has vanished. Like, from a writing perspective, that is strong. First Order immediately. Yeah, Leia leading a brave resistance. Like, look, we'll get into this. We will. We'll, we'll get into this as we go on in the video. I know some of the criticism for this film is that it's very, very similar, if not the same, with a different aesthetic to A New Hope. It's just rehashing. It's just the same story, the same, do you know what I mean? We'll get into that. However, that on its own doesn't necessarily make the story bad, so we will see. Yeah. I remember 2015, I was so hyped. It's gonna be interesting to watch the film without that and see if it holds up. Mm, see the darkness, the sinister shots here. Stormtroopers, really nicely done. Sets the tone beautifully, the music as well. Gets you right into Star Wars, right? Yeah, another opening shot of the film, uh, the new droid, right, BB-8. Hello and welcome. I don't usually do intros, but I'm gonna set the foundations for this critique, just so you know where I'm coming from and, and the baseline that I'm coming from. And also with a disclaimer or two, let's start with those. If you're new to my channel, I do focus on analytical content, analyzing media, TV shows, film, that kind of thing. That is what I'm gonna be doing today. I'm an avid Star Wars fan, but my opinion generally towards the sequels isn't that favorable. Now, I'm gonna forget all that. That's the point today. If you're not familiar with my channel, I do stop and start quite a lot. I talk, it's kind of more of a mix of, uh, well, it's commentary at its basic, but a little bit podcasty as well, stream of consciousness, that kind of thing. And I kind of talk things through, find out how I feel about things and genuinely just do that. If you want to just watch The Force Awakens, you should probably click off this video and just go watch the movie. It's not a great way to watch the movie and you might find it frustrating if you are here for that. What I am going to be trying to focus my critique on is, is it a good film? Is it a bad film in the sense of, an isolated film on its own. Now, we will also talk about where it fits into the Star Wars mythos and the culture of Star Wars as well. I will be considering all of that stuff as I go through. With that said, one more disclaimer and we'll get on with the video. This stuff's subjective. I am going to say stuff that you aren't going to agree with. It might be for the same reason that you like it, that I dislike it and vice versa. It doesn't make either of us wrong. It's art. That's what makes it beautiful. At the end of the day, the important thing is, is that we're all Star Wars fans. We all love this universe for one reason or another. And that should be the through line going forward. So without further ado, I've kept you long enough. Uh, thank you for clicking on the video. Let's go. For the general, to me, she is royalty. Leia worship. We like it. Also, by the way, it got Oscar Isaac. That's insane. He's such a good actor. We've got to remember, by the way, the first opening line of The Crawl, Luke Skywalker's vanished. That's the focus, right? That's the hook for the audience. It looks beautiful. You got to hand it to him. You take this. And you know, there's something to be said for simplicity, right? The opening crawl, Luke Skywalker's vanished. Right, we've got to find him. Easy, that's what we're doing. We have Oscar Isaac coming in here, Poe Dameron. It's like, right, this is the key. Stormtroopers are coming. They're coming to stop it. He's obviously trying to get it back to Leia. Gives it to the droid. Droid's got to go. He's got to defend. Boom. Simple. Good. Now, obviously, your plot doesn't have to be simple to be good, but already we're in... We're five minutes in. It's established everything. That's important. You've got to ground your audience, and it's done that so quickly. By this point, five minutes in, the audience knows exactly what we're we're doing. A little bit of blood on a stormtrooper's helmet. <laughs> Intriguing. Yeah, really interesting uh, transition of point of view there. We have Poe Dameron, right? He is the focus. Oh, okay, we, we know what we're doing. You're shouting the seat as an audience member. You're like, okay, I know where we're going. Then unexpectedly, you go to the perspective of, of a stormtrooper. That's nice. That's original. Look how old you've become. Something far worse has happened to you. Yeah. I know where you come from before you called yourself Kylo Ren. Intrigue. This character comes down Darth Vader looking fella. Mystery. It's like, oh, it's kind of cool. Then we've got this dialogue here. I obviously know where this goes. And what I what I would have called for actually is a little bit more of this. I'm sad that we didn't get a, a proper conversation or another conversation between Kylo and, and this guy. I'll show you the dark side. Overcompensating. You cannot deny the truth that is your family. I love how that shot, by the way. The way as he raises his saber, Sadal flinches. Raises, he flinches. Just, it's so much more brutal for that. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. I know it's supposed to tease you, right? As to Ben Soto and where he came from, where Kylo came from, right? And, and the family, the theme of family introduced again, right at the beginning, you know, establishing that is what we're going to focus on, at least in this film, if not the trilogy, right? All good stuff. I mean, Max von Sydow, you got to argue like, uh, crazy that they didn't utilize him a little bit more. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. <laughs> 
it's just very hard to understand you with all the establishes Poe as a wisecracker, right? It's, it tells you a lot about his character in a very small amount of lines. Mm. See, this makes me question, because he didn't fire. I'm actually not sure, maybe this is his first assignment, the fact that he didn't pull the trigger makes me ask the question of has he done that before though? I mean, there was obviously his comrade painting bloody finger trails on his helmet, right? So was that the crux of the of why he turned? Or is this probably more likely his first proper assignment out in the field? I, I would go with that, right? That's what I would assume based on what I've been shown. But important at this point that it's making you as the audience ask questions about him, because that hooks you, draws you in. And I think that's what it does with Finn. Initially, in his introduction here. Strong opener. All right. Where do you think you were going, buddy? <laughs> It's so interesting seeing a stormtrooper in full armor, a dirty, muddy, blood-stained. There he is. What a humanizing couple of scenes for his character. Arguably one of the most intriguing uh, character origins in the whole sequel trilogy. <laughs> Beautiful shot. And again, it makes you ask questions. All right, well, there's a fight here. What happened? I do also think choosing to focus on like animatronic puppets over just full CGI was such a strong choice. One quarter portion. Yeah, already we've established Rey as a character in a way that's, that's easy to be empathetic towards her. She's clearly either a slave or, or as close to it as she can get, right? She's not in a good situation, not super happy. She glances over as well, sorry, a minute ago, because I was like, what was that glance about? And here, to the older lady, you know, Rey's doing this, she's cleaning, doing the exact same as her across the table. Yeah, that look of realization of that's where I, she's young, she's looking across at an older lady. And I think it's asking herself the question of, is this my life? Is that going to be me in 40 years, 50 years, 60 years? Which is like, the, the film doesn't make a big deal out of that. It's subtext, right? And at least to my mind, that's the interpretation that it's trying to make you have. And so it immediately sets up in your mind that it's like, she's wondering, she's not having a good time and she wants to get out of here. And I think if you see someone in this kind of scenario, you automatically root for her, right? There's strength in creating a character that is an underdog. Yeah, strong foundations in a film to go forward with, and the characters that you've established, Poe, Finn, Rey, Kylo, emotionally bonds you to all of them really quickly, which is so important to go forward in a film with. And the film does do that. <laughs> little callbacks, little fan service in a way that is palatable, right? A Star Destroyer in the sand or an at, -AT. Your antenna's bent. All right, no need to get personal with it, mate. Where do you come from? Don't follow me. <laughs> in the morning you go. Yeah, she's understandably, she's kind, right? She stopped the guy from taking the parts, you know, taking BB-8, set him free and everything, but she is bitter. And I think that's really human. That's really understandable considering her circumstances. You know, she is layered already as a character. She's also a little bit prickly as well as warm. Well then, if it's on Jakku, we'll soon have it. Oh yeah, you know he's evil because he's ginger. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If you're ginger, it's fine. It's a little sus, but it's fine. I know all about waiting. Mmm, there you go. A little bit of uh, story peppered in. I know all about waiting. Why? Again, gets the audience asking questions. Again, just a little inch forward of the audience being like, what well, invests them. My family. Right. They'll be back one day. <laughs> oh, no. Already at this point, I'm like, nah, mate. If, you're, if you've been, how long you've been here for? But that, I feel like that's kind of obvious. It's like, uh, no. The film wants you to know, wants you to feel like, no, you're all a mm, little naive, right? But at the same time, that makes you feel for her. The film is doing a lot of work, subtly, to enamor you towards the characters you're going to be following. So far, at least, from what I'm seeing. I'll pay for him. Oh. Ooh. Ren wants the prisoner. Oh, they should call him Ren more often. That sounds way cooler than Kylo. <laughs> I'm helping you escape. Beautiful. Oh, can you fly a type I can fly anything. Why? <laughs> Why are you helping me? Because it's the right thing to do. Beautiful. Here's the thing. I forgot. I honestly forgot how, how Poe got out. But if Finn hadn't been there, the forging of this relationship here between the two of them, uh, Poe probably wouldn't have got out. It's a really strong forging of bonds between them. And a big character step at the same time for Finn's character in making this huge decision. Stay calm. I am calm. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> like, this is charming. This is charming. <laughs> 
<laughs> this thing really moves. Yeah, I love the sense of speed there. Finn, I'm gonna call you Finn, is that all right? Oh, I'm glad that you asked. I'm Poe, Poe Dameron. Oh. Good to meet you too, Finn. Beautiful. Is it the resistance pilot? <laughs> Also, it's interesting how that um, decision making um, from Kylo shows you a lot of it about his character. Because I was, I kind of caught myself there being like, I'm surprised Kylo was so cool and calm. Why wasn't he running to jump into a ship and go straight after him? Do you know what I mean? But that does show you a lot about who he is. He isn't as sure of himself as I think we perhaps see later on, which is fine, which is fair. And we have that, I know we're going to see in a, a little bit, the, the Vader worship. And Vader would have. He would have jumped straight in a ship and he would have gone after him. And it does differentiate. Kylo from Vader and actually I think sets him up as a character like I say to go forward and make strides in as well as obviously the stuff that we've been teased of you didn't come from the dark side family all this stuff Vinny that's there as well that's there to uncover and for you know his character to go forward with as well which is also very interesting but even without that on his own as a person he isn't quite the fear inducing picture the the unstoppable force that, that Vader was I mean I quite like that because it differentiates him from Vader and actually unlike a lot of the film so far, is differentiating itself from the original trilogy. Which in my mind is a positive, because I think, I, I, honestly, I think ultimately, and, and I'll revisit this, I think making it so similar in beats to A New Hope does bring it down a little bit. Doesn't mean as a film on its own, isolated from being part of this wider universe and wider universe of films, doesn't mean it's a bad film in itself. I think considering that context, it does kind of lower it in, in a lot of people's minds. And I think Kylo's representation so far actually goes a little bit of the way to differentiate as much as he is familiar in a certain way, which I like. That droid has a map that leads straight to Luke Skywalker. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> this was his first offense. Yeah, this is first offense, right? Yeah, something I think they could have done better. Because I'm, I'm looking at uh, Phasma now and I'm like, why is she not in a ship? No one seems very urgently to care that they've gone, do you know what I mean? And I feel like they should. I feel like either Kylo or Phasma should, especially considering Phasma, it's her trooper, right? Surely she should feel the wrath of Kylo or somebody if, you know, it's found out that it was hers. And you know, like that that's the chain of command, right? She's gotta take the take the hit on that because that, that is her responsibility. And I think actually, obviously we have Poe being like, oh, I'm the best pilot in the resistance. You know, it's been established. I can fly anything, right? That's that's who, who, who he is. And I think you, you could have taken that a bit further in this scene because all he's actually doing, impressive, though it might be, is avoiding cannon fire, which you would argue that most pilots should be able to do, right? If he's the best pilot in the galaxy, you know, on the res resistance, whatever, I don't know, it would have done a little bit more to do something a little bit more special with the scene of them getting away from the ship. And I think actually, perhaps not Kylo, but someone like Phasma going out and having a little bit of a dogfight. Maybe we see something new. Maybe she's got like a souped up ship and she's got something that's like really unique, right? That would again differentiate itself from, you know, the past films, something we haven't seen before. And we could actually see in action a little bit more because at the same time that's not more runtime it's the same exact scene just slightly different and you know they they're both good at that point because they're both avoiding cannon fire from the ship itself do you know what i mean so yeah yeah i think the film could have done a little bit more in regard to both phasma's character poe's character in proving how good he is and also just making the scene a little bit more exciting than just dodging cannon fire right and i think that the, the focus is on him and finn's relationship and kind of you know having a little bit of dialogue between them you know it's fun it's 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 adrenaline fueled and, and it's and it's also so fun to watch right but they they choose they choose to focus on that a little bit more rather than perhaps the beats under the surface of these characters kind of and their arcs and their intertwinings and, and perhaps going a little bit further with what you've set up as well Mm. Also separating Finn from the authority figure, Poe. Poe knows everything. Poe's the good pilot. Poe can get them out of it. Suddenly he's on his own. And it's testing him, which is good. You got to test your characters as yeah as well. Do you know what, though? I do feel like it's a bit of a shame in a certain sense as well that they separated Poe from Finn at this point. Because, again, I know where the film goes and I know that we focus on Rey and Finn. And I think it's, it, like I say, it's a strength in one way that Poe has been separated from Finn. Finn's got to go on his own for a second. At the same time, I remember how good the actors in uh, Daisy Ridley, John Boyega and Oscar Isaac are when they're in a scene together. It's electric. It's fun. And I, and I do feel like, at least to my recollection, the trilogy should have focused on that a a lot more than it did. And I think while separating Poe from Finn here is good on paper, uh, just because I know how good they all are together, it's important because they, they for the character development of Finn and Rey and, and working it out for themselves and it, and it being a little bit bumbling, like if Poe was there, it would go a little bit smoother. And so it would, you know what I mean? I, I get why they did it, 
but I feel like they've done a really good job at establishing each of them individually up until this point. And I do feel like it would be a stronger film if they unite the trio and have them going through the film a little bit more together and establishing them more as a group. Just because I know how good they are together and how electric the scenes are when they're all bouncing off of each other. I just feel like there could have there could have been some really nice scenes from that. My men are exceptionally trained. The mission have no problem retrieving the droid. Careful, Ren. Mm. That your personal interests not interfere with orders from leader Snoke. Interesting how it's arraying him apart almost from the First Order as well. It's establishing that he's not quite in the hierarchy. He's a little bit outside of it. Again, intriguing. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Go on, mate. Stick your tongue in. Yeah, that's there you go. <laughs> Sorry, I, this is a little meta, right? Because I, I know some of the criticisms, etc. So I do hold them in my mind. The reason I mentioned the trio getting together and it's like, I, I know that that's not how the film goes. The only reason I mention it is because if I was watching it for the first time, I would be like, oh, I really hope we get them all together at some point because they seem like fun, interesting characters. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, that's the only reason I mention it. That's the only reason I'm kind of going outside of the, the chronological order of the film and, and going to, and drawing on information that I already know because I know what I would be asking at this point in the film. Just to be clear. So. I am going to be drawing on some of the criticisms because I know that one of them is that Ray's a bit of a Mary Sue and I'm going to be watching for that, right? And quite frankly, like, yeah, she fought off the guys. I I personally do find it very believable that the character we've seen so far in the film, considering what we know of her, that she would already know how to fight. Perhaps she's not the best fighter in the world, but I think at least the scene that we just saw in her fighting those guys off, I mean, it was, it was a bit of a brawl as well, right? They came up behind, she bit on the arm. It wasn't clean. It wasn't precise. She just whacked him. She did what she had to. And I find that perfectly believable considering her surroundings and where she's from. It is a cutthroat planet. She's in a cutthroat situation. She is in a desperate situation where I can imagine she's had to fight here, there, and you know, every so often. So that alone is perfectly believable. <laughs> You would run, wouldn't you? Yeah, mate. I'd, be, I'd have taken off, dude. No way. She's coming out with me with that face? Absolutely not. Ow! Hey! Poor Finn. I've had a pretty messed up day, all right? He has. So you're with the Resistance? Obviously. <laughs> with the Resistance, yeah. I am with the Resistance. <laughs> oh, this is what we look like. <laughs> he has a map that Lisa Luke Skywalker. I thought he was a myth. Yeah, okay, so the myth thing. I get, like, right, that seems a little odd to me. It's a big galaxy though, isn't it? Like, this is, it's an interesting question, right? Because we don't have a scale model of this. We don't know. You think of the world right now, you know, and me in England. The US is the other side of the world to me. We have so many people just on this one planet. You know, it's completely feasible that Luke would have started the Jedi Order apart from the political structure of the, you know, Republic. Especially if it's planets away, planets away, planets, you know, light years away, especially if you're not in the uh, the core, I think it is feasible. It seems like an odd line. It does. It absolutely does. I think I grant you. But I think that's because we're coming at it from like Luke Skywalker is what he is in the universe, right? We are coming from a very unique perspective. But I do think feasibly in the actual law of this universe, it's completely feasible for that to be her reaction. I honestly do think that. But I know because sorry, I'm deep into I love the expanded universe and all that stuff. And I grew up on the old expanded universe. I've read some of the new expanded universes well, which I also like. And so I know that during the, you know, tenure of the Empire and the war against the Empire, he was a little bit of a force of nature, a mystery. And that to a lot of people, the only knowledge that they knew was that Luke Skywalker walked into a room with Vader and the Emperor, and he was the only one that came out alive. Which I imagine, to a certain extent, for a lot of people, it's like, no, he didn't. That's not what happened. That's just a story you've made up. Like, there's not a person that could possibly do that fake. Absolutely not. That's a myth. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can see that. I can see where that would come from. And the galaxy's so big and, you know, the events of the war, right, however many years ago with between the Empire and the Rebels at this point, completely feasible to see that as very distant, especially for someone like Rey who is quite young. I think we do underestimate the size of the galaxy and how the story is told to us through this medium of film. And so we are intimately aware and knowledgeable about all this stuff, but how the galaxy and the inhabitants of it, so vast as it is, that just because of the nature of that, I, I do think it's easy for us to get get caught up in questions of, you know, even stuff like in the, when it comes to the prequels and the uh, originals, in A New Hope, it's like, are oh, the Jedi, the force to religion that's, you know, 
ancient. That's a bit of a clunky line considering what we know the prequels, right? But I, I, again, I, I think stuff like that, I think is easily explainable by, by what I'm talking about, right? I think, I think you can get away with that. And I think that makes absolute sense. And actually, again, if anything, her line there, Luke Skywalker's a myth is very reminiscent of that line in A New Hope of, ah, the force, it's an ancient religion, which considering how closely tied they are, I can imagine maybe that's why that line is in this. <laughs> Yeah, this is the thing, stuff like that. I don't think a lot of people understand what it is to grow up as a girl, as a woman, and for your only representation in media to be that. I know that I'm obviously a guy talking about it. I get you, but also I have friends that are women <laughs> who I talk to. And I've also watched media from all different periods of time as well. And it's like, if you go back to all of the, just well, just movies in general, like nine times out of 10, the representation of the woman in that is gonna be sexy, love interest, barely any lines, nothing to do acting wise. All of the meat of the acting is, is the lead man. The point as well is that women aren't often put in those lead roles. And so growing up as a girl, watching movies and TV and always seeing them in a place of, weakness next to men, which isn't representative of how things are, how they should be. And so people are going to read into stuff like that of like, oh, it's, it's like, why are you upset? It's giving women a platform in a way that they haven't had. That's not a bad thing. The issue was the representation they've had previously. It's always the lead man holding their hand and taking them and being like, come with me. She is a strong character in her own right. We've also seen that established. Women can be that and are that. The only disservice here is that this sort of thing has to be put into media to redress the balance and the injustice that we have done to women in the past. That's all it is. Sorry, I know I've talked a lot but this stuff is important and if you have an eye towards analyzing media you do notice it you know i think if you're getting angry at that kind of stuff you've got to start to ask yourself why because it is prevalent there is a reason it's been put in and it is important to put that kind of stuff in as well because media is so powerful are you okay yeah <laughs> follow me <laughs> what about that that garbage. beautiful hello there it is this ship hasn't flown in years a mm, little bit of backstory we like it <laughs> ah yeah so mary sue who flies everything perfectly does everything perfectly at all times uh-huh yeah and it makes sense that she can fly it she just said before she got in there he was like you know a pilot you we need a pilot we've got so she's been established that she can fly. She took a second to get to know the controls. We know as the audience, it's an old ship. Sorry, I just, I do. I'm looking for this stuff as I go through because I'm pretty sure people are like, how can she fly the Falcon? It's like, it's been established in the film that she's a pilot. She's around ship parts all the time. Like we're assuming she doesn't know ships intimately. Do you know what I mean? Like there's precedence that she knows what she's doing when she gets in a ship. And I just feel like that kind of criticism, if she was a guy, wouldn't exist. It'd be like, oh yeah, of course, of course a guy can work it out. She scraped it along the ground and then she figured it out. Like, do you know what I mean? It's just, it's natural, it's organic. Finn is coming from a background where he's a stormtrooper. He was in the tent a minute ago being like, is, is, is there no blasters anywhere, right? He can already shoot a blaster. We're coming to these characters, not as newborn babies, but they have skills already. Poe, best pilot in the resistance, established straight away. We haven't seen him train. We haven't seen him learn that. He just is. Finn does, Poe does, and Ray does. The only difference is she's a woman. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's like, you got to kind of pay attention to that stuff. And there's arguably more evidence in the film for Finn and Rey than there is for Poe. Try sitting in this thing. <laughs> Also, sorry, while I'm on it, because she is, she's, she's flying beautifully. And you know, you go back to the prequels and young Anakin as a kid being a, an amazing pod racer, which let's not forget, they're both like Anakin, Ray. they're both force sensitive. When you find that out, it does go a lot of the way to explaining how she has really good reflexes. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose it's also the co-pilot thing, right? I will be completely honest with you. I always assumed, watching the originals, and I know this is subjective, obviously, but I just kind of assumed that Chewie was there to flick a few buttons and just make it a bit easier, do you know what I mean? And also, like, the Falcon as a ship is always established as rickety, and it's very customised in ways that aren't efficient. So it's like, I do feel like a lot of the co-pilotness of the Millennium Falcon is down to bad design, but bad design that is utilised really well by Han. So it's like, I don't think the co-pilot is like absolutely necessary. Again, I think precedent to say, in my opinion, knowing what I know about the Falcon, that someone absolutely can pilot on their own. It's just easier if you have someone in that seat. You set me up for it. It That was, was pretty good. Oh, this is sweet. He's with the resistance. And this is the thing, you can't have Poe here because then you can't demonstrate 
Ray's expertise as well. And quite frankly, she struggled against two TIE fighters. I can't imagine Poe would have. As exciting as it was, and as almost as scuffed as it was because Ray was in the pilot seat, which made it more exciting, we wouldn't have got in that way, and it wouldn't have been as exciting if Poe had been there. Escape capture aboard a stolen Carillion YT model freighter. <laughs> Don't take it personally. <laughs> what I do really like is the effect of the saber itself and the way it's almost like fire. The blade, like almost the light of the blade is oscillating. The unstableness of it. I'm not with the resistance, okay? <laughs> Where's your base? BB-8, tell it. <laughs> lenium system. Yeah, the lenium system. That's the one. There as fast as you can. <laughs> I love that. I still love that. No, the one I'm pointing to. No. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, mate. I'm thin in this situation, mate. I don't know. Not a clue. Like, if you want to talk cars, mate, just tell me the colour. That's all I need to know. I can't be good. No, I can't be. You know, as much as I was saying that I, I wanted Poe here, like, it, it works without him. They have that electricity. The way the scene plays is really synergistic between all three of them. Get <laughs> I got it. Yeah, this is nice so far. I mean, the pacing's really nice, actually. We're, we're moving forward while also, like I say, establishing and, and developing the relationships between Finn, Ray, BB-8. Hey. The rebellion general? No, the smuggler. Wasn't he a war hero? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a certain level of like that scene that played out. There's a little bit too meta. You know, it's a little bit fan servicey in the sense of like, okay, the audience are really gonna love these new characters falling all over these characters that the audience loves, right? I do kind of wish that they were just like, who are you? You must stress, stress on, on the hyperdrive. hyperdrive. Beautiful. Let's be friends. Luke Skywalker. Mm-hmm. I knew Luke. Rathor's on this freighter. How'd you get him on board? You used to have a bigger crew. <laughs> yeah, something I will say, like I've kind of previously mentioned, this film kind of exists in two spaces, right? It exists in, like I say, a film on its own two feet in its own right, and also uh, a film that exists within this wider universe of films. And I think, Han being introduced here, I think when you're talking about just the film itself, right, individual and contained, he is serving as a nice kind of connector, right, from this part of the film to the next. But like I say, I think a lot of the way that his character is played, at least right now and, and in his introduction, is playing on what the audience knows, the nostalgia of obviously you're seeing Harrison Ford, you're seeing Han Solo, you're seeing Chewbacca, which is fine, right? If you want to do that initially, absolutely fine. But I do feel like to a certain extent, it can get a little bit indulgent. Because I think as a character on his own, the way that they present him in like, he doesn't quite know who he is of, you know, Finn and Ray being like, isn't he the smuggler? Isn't he the rebellion leader? Wasn't he war general wasn't he but 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 do you know what I mean and it's like to a certain extent they're kind of reversing the character development that he had in previous films in the original trilogy I don't like that element of his introduction as a character Han Solo in this film looking at Han and his introduction through those two lens I think with one it succeeds without the nostalgia without kind of knowing that and as a character in this film I think he works personally in my opinion his reintroduction as the mythical Han Solo doesn't quite just because of the way he's presented have I ever not delivered for you before yeah. <laughs> what was the second time? <laughs> we said the fuses should do it. Yeah, she's techie. The precedent was set and it's carrying on with that. <laughs> Finn! Oh, mate, at this point, if I were her, I'd be like, nah, he's gone, mate. That's it. <laughs> that was lucky. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I don't think it's unfeasible for his character to have regressed. To a certain extent, yeah, sure, he got to where he got to in the original trilogy. At the same time, what was familiar to him? He was part of the rebellion and became, you know, a general because of his friends. And once they won, once that's done, it's like, what is there, right? And I think asking the question from a character perspective is is, is interesting in that sense. It's like, I think someone then going back to the thing that they, they know, they're good at, right? The war's done, the war's finished, can't be a general anymore. Not really, right? You can still do that, but without the war, I can see a reality where Han gets bored of that, doesn't want to do that, right? He wants the life of the smuggler. Excitement, something that he knows he's familiar with and that gives him joy in some way. And So I, 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 I can understand why a character would do what he did and go back to that kind of life. And in that sense, it's not so much a regression or a reverse of, you know, character progression. And I think that does make sense. You, you, can, you can come from that perspective. I just don't.
don't like it personally. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying he can't be that. I just, it seems as if that is just who he is now. And I get it. The film has to introduce him and have him looking for the Falcon and, and introduce him to the film in a certain way, right? I don't know. It does seem a little bit contrived for me though. Any weakness in his introduction into this film does come because it's Han Solo and we know where he's come from. If you make it any other character, I think it, it kind of works. Would people have been invested if it was any other character? Not necessarily, not right off the bat. You got to do a bit of work, right? But they've already done that with Ray, Finn and Poe so far. I think they have and I think they've done that really effectively. So they can do that. It's been proven that they can. So yeah, that's where I kind of fall on it. Is that even possible? I never asked that question until after I've done it. <laughs> Yeah, and obviously it's also tying together and inciting Kylo's anger because it's Han and the Millennium Falcon. Like, I, I get why, I just feel like they could have got there a bit more elegantly. We should destroy the government that supports the Resistance, the Republic. Without their friends to protect them, the Resistance will be vulnerable. Yeah, this is the thing as well. So they've now established the differentiation between the Republic and the Resistance. And it's like, it does in your mind at that point get to a place of like, why is there a Resistance then? Why aren't the Republic fighting against the First Order? And I know that that's explored in books because I've read those books. But I think when you're telling a film, and that is integral to the the forces at play, I do feel like I'm missing part of the film. I, I, I really do. And, and at the very least, it makes you ask questions. That makes you ask questions. It's like, like the question that I just asked, why are they separate? And I'm intrigued by that. And sorry, I know that they don't answer that in the film. So I do think Snoke is cool. Again, more questions, right? It makes you, he makes you ask questions. It's like, who is he? Where's he come from? Is he someone we know? And I think his introduction into the film in this way, very grand, right? Very menacing. I think he's, he's great. The droid we seek in the hands of your father. So long. Mm, intrigue. We like it. It's good. We shall see. I was a little bit disappointed, I'll be honest with you. When I saw that in the film, I was like, God, he's not that big. Are you serious? Like, you know, I kind of wanted him to be huge. I did. He almost killed me six times. <laughs> Which is fine. <laughs> What'd you do? I bypassed the compressor. Yeah, again, I, I know I know people have problems with Ray coming in and taking over almost or knowing the Falcon better than Han did. But again, I think there's precedent for that. We opened on her character and she's inside a Star Destroyer, taking it apart, taking parts out to sell. She knows intimately the parts of ships. And I get a Star Destroyer is slightly different to the, the YT, but same basic principle. It's already also been established that she is a pilot. So she does have more knowledge than just obviously taking them apart, identifying what she can sell, what, what is of value and crawling around knowing where to find stuff and having that knowledge. I think there's precedent for her knowing that as well. The Falcon has been on Jakku for a while. She makes the comment of like it's garbage, which means that she's probably been in it. She knows the system. She's no, I'm not saying she's tried to fly it before, but there's absolute precedent for her acting the way she is and having the knowledge that she does when she's in here. Finn is with the resistance, just a scavenger. <laughs> I love that little look that you gave him of like, yeah, okay, no, he's not. Ever since Luke disappeared. Why did he leave? Yeah, again, this through line, it doesn't get mentioned so often, but again, we're getting it back. It reintroduced so the audience doesn't forget, right? We have scenes of action, 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 action stuff happening. Boom, we're back. Luke, Luke Skywalker, that's the focus of the film. That's what we're trying to get to. Not mentioned too often, but just enough that you keep the audience on track and remind you of like, oh yeah, of course we are. Yeah, we're looking for him. And again, makes you start asking that question. And all those questions that you do start asking of like, where is he? But also why? Why did he go? what caused him to go. Which again, keeping the audience hooked really effectively. He was training a new generation of Jedi. Okay. One boy, an apprentice turned against him, destroyed it all. It is annoying because I, I hear those lines of like, oh yeah, he was creating a new Jedi order uh, uh, and a student overthrew it all. I it makes me want to see that. And there's part of me watching the film that I'm like, why are we not telling that story, you know, in episode seven? Why is that not the first film? And then we go over the course of the film and we perhaps see some of that, you know, seduction by Snoke and all that stuff. And we end with Ben overthrowing it all. The Jedi were real. I used to wonder about that myself. Yeah, that line again, the Jedi were real. And I, I, again, I, I understand it. I think Luke would, if you're making a new Jedi order, I think there's absolutely wisdom in the decision to keep the fact that you're building that secret, considering the history in the past and how the Jedi were perceived in the end, you know, by the Empire. The Empire were in power for a long time as well and poisoned the galaxy at large against the Jedi. That was the point. We saw that in the prequels, right? They were working against democracy, working against 
against the Republic and they had to be eliminated, right? As much as that wasn't true and as much as you can try and reverse that as much as possible, that's not, you're not going to be able to eradicate that feeling in people. So I think Luke perhaps making the decision to keep keep it a secret, not be out in the galaxy, obviously not as well. I think that's enough to, to show us that he didn't integrate them into the Republic in the same way that we saw in the prequels that they were. So I think there's precedent again to say, at least from what I've seen in the film so far, that that line from Ray does make sense. It's true. The Force, the Jedi, all of it. It's all true. What his lines there do do is make a new audience to the franchise wonder at the Jedi and the Force. It, you know, it inspires that wonder and it makes it very mysterious as well, right? Because we haven't seen any of that in the film so far. So I, I think this film would be doing a great job in uh, enrapturing a new audience. I think again, where it falls flat a little bit more is perhaps people coming in and already knowing this stuff and being like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Give me something new. Do you know what I mean? But again, considering this is a film that's introducing us, reintroducing us again into this galaxy, I think it works in the film they're trying to tell. Yeah. And again, the way that it's kind of drip feeding Luke, it's doing the same with the Jedi and the Force. Doing it in that way, it teases the audience. And again, I think draws the audience in. And I think that works for a new audience, but also for the old audience, it makes you wonder who's going to be the Jedi. Finn, Poe, Rey. You've got to assume at this point, Finn or Rey, but I think that drip feeding of the mystery of the force from that perspective does work because of that. You know how to use one of those? Yeah, you pull the trigger. <laughs> Are you offering me a job? Wouldn't be nice to you. Hi, right, mate. But I have to get home. Jacko. I've already been away too long. Yeah, and that and that reminds you that she's tied to this naivety of waiting for her parents. Maz Kanata is our best bet. She's run this watering hole for a thousand years. A thousand years. I forgot that, to be honest. That's so interesting. She is a Yoda-like species in the sense of the longevity of May. We should absolutely linger more on her, for sure. Like, what does she know? <laughs> Yeah, to this point in the film, actually, seeing all of these different species that I would have hoped, because I like that, I would have hoped that from this point forward, we see more new stuff. This would be a really nice, natural point for the film, because, like, at this point in the film, I'm watching it, and you do, you see the familiarity, you see the way that they're doing similar beats to, you know, what people are familiar with and the originals and new, A New Hope. And I think, actually, that would have gone a lot better if they would have done that maybe in the first part of the film and then in the second been like, right, we're going to do something new now. And this would have been a really nice nice point to do that. What I will say is that I feel like the, the film is, is losing a little bit of its tightness, which doesn't have to be a bad thing. And I will keep, I'll, I'll pay attention to that as we go on. But as we panned on Starkiller Base there and the Star Destroyer coming past, it made me realize that I don't actually know that much about the First Order. And we got introduced to them in the opening crawl and it's like, okay, the First Order versus the Resistance, right? Questions, you have questions. Then you have the tidbit of like the Republic and the Resistance are separate, more questions. And then we're back again on, you know, this, this shot of Starkiller Base that we don't know that much about. You can make an educated guess based on, you know, how it looks. But I think that shot there and the Star Destroyer coming past made me, again, naturally question of like, why are they here? What's their goal? What are they trying to do? Is it just simply to reignite the Empire? Which, you know, I can kind of come out of myself right now and be like, well, yeah, that's pretty much because I have the knowledge of, you know, uh, later films and everything, what they're doing. But it does make me, because I asked that question, it makes me look back at the film of like, what do I know? And as we've gone on in the story, more and more questions are being asked and as much as I said at the beginning that the film grounded itself really well established the story really well in the first five minutes of like okay this is what we're going to be going on with that of what we're still going on with and what is established in the first five minutes is still what we're dealing with now and we're an hour in nothing much has changed and we haven't learned a great deal more which isn't a bad thing like I say and I think when you're the first film in a trilogy that makes sense right because you are opening up the world but alongside that opening up and, and introducing more things of Han coming in you know the Republic being mentioned separate to the Resistance Snoke being mentioned right who's he what's he the First Order panning back to them again and being like are they just a splinter group is it just what we see here or do they have more of a presence around the galaxy right at the same time that they're widening the focus of the film they're not actually telling you any specifics and like I say that leads to a, an almost a, a lessening of the the tightness of the film in the way 
that that simplicity that, that allows you to get into the film straight away uh, and is a boon as you start the film. I'm kind of losing that a little bit, right? Because it's like, as they've widened the scope, you would argue, okay, that simplicity should widen with it, but it's not. That still is that simplistic kind of plot point of the film so far for the first hour hasn't changed. And as much as everything else has widened, that plot point hasn't widened with it. Do you know what I mean? And so it, it kind of, in me, it's creating this effect of like, it's very focused plot wise. What they're doing right now is, okay, they've got BB-8, they're trying to get to resistance. That's the focus, Luke Skywalker, that's where we're going. Very tight focus. But as we get more and more information, right, this is the focus here and the background information, it's widening, widening, widening. And it creates almost this empty space between the focus of the plot and what I know about the wider galaxy and the situation at play, because I don't know a great deal about that right now. And I think what that creates is this dissonance between those two things. And because the strength of the film is the tightness of the plot. And by widening the scope of the film, it make, making you ask questions in the way that I have, it makes me almost want to be over there, find out more about that. But because the plot is so tightly focused on Ray, Finn, Han, Chewie, their goal, in a way that's not quite been accommodated into the wide scope that they've, they've slowly introduced over the first hour. Like I say, it makes me want to know more. I'm not finding out more and it, and it creates this like level of dissatisfaction in me. That's what I'm kind of getting at, right? Like I say, this tight focus, the widening scope, this gap in between of like, we're not bridging that gap so much and it leaves this emptiness alongside what we're kind of getting, at least for me. And so I think with what they've introduced and what they've kind of slowly started widening without actually really touching on anything, we have this kind of recipe of something that should be really tight and capturing your attention and still have your attention, but because we've had so much of the same for so long and so much more introduced, your attention wavers. Because we, you know, we get to Maz Kanata and Han has that line of like, oh, she's a thousand years old. It's like, what? Okay, we're gonna do something with that, right? Right? And like, obviously I know that we're here and then we move on afterwards, do you know what I mean? And I think that's some of the, while I'm enjoying the tightness of the plot that we are getting, there is also alongside that, this level of emptiness and dissatisfaction with what I'm also alongside that being presented with. And that's just not quite working for me. And I will finish what you started. Yeah, interesting, intriguing. Again, more questions. And it's like, we've had this small scene with him and it almost makes me want to stay with him. You know what I mean? This is what I mean. They're introducing more questions, more interesting, intriguing stuff, which is good, but they're flitting so quickly between one thing and the other, not focusing on any of these things or giving me any answers alongside it. That it's, yeah, it's an interesting mix that I don't know is quite working. You don't know the first order like I do. They'll slaughter us. I mean, she's a thousand years old. She's probably seen something, you know. Trans Transportation to the outer rim. You can disappear. Keep it, kid. Yeah, it's interesting how Han must see a lot of himself in Finn, actually. You know, Finn kind of being like, look, I appreciate the fight. I don't want any part of it. I'm a stormtrooper. Brilliant. Honestly, we're getting progress in their relationships. Nice. For my first battle. I made a choice. First battle, right, there we go. Come with me. Don't go. Yeah, do you know what? It is kind of crazy to me. I think the story that they're going for and that they wrote works without Poe, but it's wild to me that they took so much from A New Hope and not the trio getting together. Do you know what I mean? Because that's what they're going for. A New Hope, Force Awakens, the parallel between them. And so while I understand that the plot they're going for doesn't allow for that, it's kind of wild to me that they didn't incorporate that in at the same time. And I feel like to a certain extent might have made, if they had worked that in there a little bit more because he has the knowledge all of the things that i'm talking about the dissonance between the focus of the story the tight focus of the story but the widening of the scope of the universe and the the story at large in the galaxy right poe would fix that because he has knowledge he has knowledge of the, the questions that i'm asking maybe that's why they omitted him as well right because they didn't want to give all that away necessarily all at once and i'm not saying that they should be answering all my questions by the way like that you know first film first hour of a film you, you can't be answering all the questions right but you gotta i don't know that the pacing of how it's going just creates the the dissonance that I'm talking about, right? Because they're introducing a lot without much more focus. And like I say, Poe would be a conduit for tightening that, the widening scope, tightening that scope to be more within the, the plot, the main plot point that we've got with Ray and uh, getting to the resistance. And it's like, I feel like they've almost backed themselves into a corner because they can't have Poe here with the story they're telling. But I do feel like to a certain extent, they need a character like Poe. I mean, Han should be that, but he's not being that. <laughs> BB-8, so cute. Mm. Mm. See, this is interesting. And again, teasing out the mystery of the Jedi and the Force. Yeah, and a big draw for the mystery of the film is Luke's absence. The Knights of Ren. 
Yeah, it's kind of wild to me that Kylo with the Knights of Ren aren't chasing them, aren't closer. They're not having, do you know what I mean? They're not biting at Rey's and Han's heels. I know that Kylo is about to turn up, but I feel like... <sighs> I feel like tying the First Order, having like like a Poe character there alongside them being like, why are they so obsessed with this? What is the draw? Why are they so, do you know what I mean? And I feel like tying the First Order more tightly to this plot, the, the main plot, right? In the way of connecting Kylo and the Knights of Ren and, and them being the representation for that. And perhaps the trail of how we have gone so far of them obviously being chased and on the run, it organically raises the question in like Finn and Rey, because Finn at that point is like, why are they so obsessed. Ray is like, we can't get a breather what's going on. And if you have a character like Poe there, it's like, so this is what's going on in the galaxy. This is why they're so obsessed with Luke Skywalker. This is what happened. And, and you then have that widened scope, not so far away from the plot because it's happening in the main group that we are focusing on. And so sorry, I do feel like the film at this point is lacking a little bit of that focus. By the way, it's at this point that I should say, what I'm talking about, if this widening of the scope and the focus that we have, it's not necessarily a bad thing and some of what I'm working with is retrospective knowledge. I know now where I am in the present 2024 that when they conceived of these films they didn't have a plan. They didn't know where they were going to go when they wrote this film. They didn't have an overall arc for the trilogy itself and what I'm talking about is an after effect of that because it's like obviously if you're writing with that knowledge of like okay I don't know where it's going to go. I know generally what the scope of the conflict is. We're going to have the First Order, we're going to have the Resistance, the Republic are there but you know whatever Luke Skywalker's going to be missing we're going to introduce these characters Ray and Finn they're going to be the main ones Poe's going to be there but then go out and he's not going to be part of it blah 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 we have the plot for this film and that's going to be that we don't know where it's going to go so obviously you're going to make it as open as possible so you're not going to screw the person who's going to come in afterwards and write the next film because otherwise the more specific you make it the more you're going to write yourself into a corner that the next filmmaker is going to have to write themselves out of so it's like naturally you would write it that way so what I am saying is that that is the result of that kind of planning and the effect that it has on me of okay yeah the plot is strangely tight but it's also very unspecific and while it's making me ask a lot of questions which is good and it's intriguing and there are intriguing things about it and the tight plot that we're focusing on is good we keep panning to the first order we keep getting mentions of Maz Kanata thousand year old we keep getting mentions of the resistance and the republic who are separate we get Snoke mentioned as well we get the Knights of Ren mentioned we get okay Kylo's got a thing for Vader cool all of these separate things outside of this type plot that are very unspecific which I do find my mind going off on and wishing that I was there finding out more about that and so that's the dissonance that I'm talking about about the way that the story's been told and the effect that it has on this film that they didn't know where they were gonna go with it and the way that it actually as much as they are telling a good story and they and they are as well right you can still enjoy the film even though what I'm saying is in my opinion true you can still enjoy the film and I am enjoying the film because there are good points to it but the film could have been altogether tighter and you don't necessarily have to be casting off a plot point of like look what's happening over there we're not going to tell you much about it but that's that's happening you don't have to do that as much when you as the writer of the film know where you're going with the story then you can be more specific about things because what this feels like is that rather than like a full meal on one plate it feels like I'm being handed plate after plate after plate and I'm only being given one bite of each plate and I'm like, oh, that's that's great. Can I have more of that? No, here's another plate. It's like, whoa, I wasn't done with that. Do you know what I mean? And it's, so it's, it's kind of that effect, but the plot that we are focused on for the most part with Ray and Han and Finn is like this bowl of soup that's always there and it's nice and it's good and I'm enjoying that. But it is the same soup at all times and I'm like, this is good. I'm getting all this variety introduced. I'm getting bites of it and it's good, but they keep running away after. And I'm like, where you go wait whoa where you go it's that kind of effect so it's really hard to explain and sorry i have not done it in the most succinct way i will be quite honest with you again these videos are very much stream of consciousness i'm kind of figuring out how i feel about stuff as i go along and and, and trying to nail that down a little bit more tightly ironically so it's like it's not that i'm not enjoying it and it's not that i don't have like a good bowl of soup in front of me it's that they're telling the story in such a way that i think is because of what I know of they didn't have a plan. That's kind of what they have to do. If you don't have a plan, you've got to make it as vague as possible almost and not answer things. It's like, it's fine. The next filmmaker will be specific and do what they want with it. But like I say, th that's the effect it's having. That lightsaber 
was Luke's and his father's before him. Yeah, and still that theme of family. And also the obviously the family theme with Kylo and Han we've had as well. So again, that theme that we got introduced right at the beginning, family has maintained. Whomever you're waiting for on Jakku, they're never coming back. Yeah, good. She needs to hear that. And good. And hey, look, we've had the thousand year old being, this wise being that we've been teased with, coming to this naive character, this young character and giving her wisdom in a way that is going to shape her path going forward. That's nice to see. I am no Jedi, but I know the force. Feel it. Yeah, this is so interesting. And Maz is so interesting. And this idea of her knowing the force, but not being a Jedi. I'm never touching that thing again. I don't want any part of this. Which makes sense. She's still in that headspace of, no, 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 I've got to go back to Jakku. That is, I mean, that's been her reality for many, many years, right? Her whole life, really, up until this point since her parents left. She can't just unlearn that, right? So that makes sense. That's absolutely organic storytelling. She's going to rail against that for a little bit. Yeah, you know what I mean? Go out to the woods, have a walk, clear your head. The New Republic lies to the galaxy. Do they? How? Now I'm at the point where I'm like asking questions, I'm intrigued, but it's annoying because it's you're making me ask almost too many while not satisfying any of it to a certain extent. And again, it's important to do that to a certain extent, especially in the first half of the film and also when you're considering it's the first in a trilogy. You have to do that to an extent. But I do feel like at this point they've gone over that to the point that it's slightly irritating. And it's interesting because I remember watching this at the time and being like, I'm cool with it because I know I've got another film to come soon. Episode 8 is going to come and they're going to answer all that. So I remember at the time kind of excusing this kind of thing because I was like, they, they're not going to not answer that eventually. They're going to give me that. They're setting everything up here and then we're going to go into it and delve into it later on. And I do feel like we don't so much. Hey, really cool visuals. I got to give them that. And this as well, you know, beautiful visuals. Again, Phasma in the background, why has she not been sent out to hunt? If you actually think about where Kylo and Phasma have been this entire time, Kylo's been on this ship, Phasma mulling about as well, like they're introduced in the film and, and very little really is, is done with them. Yeah. Okay, so the film is like presenting this as like a really heart-rending moment, really horrible. Right, here we go. We're destroying the Republic. This moment that should be tragic and should be rending my heart, right? I should be feeling something, but it's like, because you haven't given me anything in regard to who the Republic are, who's on those planets. Like, I don't feel anything for it. I just, I don't, they haven't built that up. So they haven't earned the heartache. It's worth mentioning here that I think the entire point of this is to give rise to a far off war that brings our heroes together. Finn stays, Rey takes up the saber. I get it. It's very a new hope. It's just a bit weak for me. And I think the intent of it doesn't justify the magnitude of what they're portraying in the film. Not to mention it's played as if you care. It would have been more powerful to make it sudden. No music. You don't see any humans, perhaps just the echo of their screams playing over the shot. That would have been genuinely horrifying. Would wouldn't have come across as cheaply trying to tug on my heartstrings and still would have had the same end result of bringing the gang together. You have to play with what you set up and the film fails to do that here. First order, they've done it. Which is a shame. And it's like, even if you liked that and weren't bothered by it, all I'm saying is, is that that could have been so much more powerful if they presented it a bit differently. Again, beautiful visuals. Like this film has a lot going for it. It's kind of wild to me that Maz, thousand year old that she is, doesn't have a little bit more, I don't know, defences? <sighs> Something. Like, I don't know, like a battalion of droids to defend the uh, castle? Yeah. I'm like, why aren't the Knights of Ren with him? Like, you know, you can come up with loads of reasons why they're not, but I think the, the only one that matters is because if they were there, who's there to combat all of them? Do you know what I mean? It wouldn't work. These guys aren't powerful enough. Which seems cheap to me. Like, you introduce the Knights of Ren as a concept in the film, which they have already. Make them part of your film. Let's see them in action. That could be a really cool scene. Get a fight choreographer. Bang. And this is where like another character might come in and, and enhance that experience, right? Because it's like, okay, right now there's no one to combat the Knights of Ren. You gotta imagine they're, they're mostly melee combatants. Finn, fine, he's got a lightsaber, he can maybe fight them. He's had some training as a stormtrooper. We see, see the stormtrooper in a moment with the baton or whatever he's got. So clearly Finn went through some kind of melee training. We've seen that Ray has a little bit of melee training, but I mean, what, how many are there? There's like five of them or something like that. This is where maybe someone like Poe, if he was somehow a part of this story or another character was part of this story, maybe even 
Mers has some combat experience and can like, do you know what I mean? Because we don't know much about her. At that point, if you're like, okay, for me, I'm like, okay, the Knights of Ren, super cool. Find a way to put them in this scene. Oh, the Knights of Ren would win? Okay, write yourself out of that. How can you write yourself out of that? I feel like you got to ask yourself a question that I'm kind of asking about, okay, how do we make that so that the heroes can get out and win somehow, even if they lose something or it's difficult? And either, again, I mean, I, I got to stop talking about Poe because honestly, if Poe's here at this point, it unravels too much. So this is what I mean where it's like, okay, Maz, have her be like a Terra Kasi master. Have her be a hand-to-hand -hand combatant. Have her incorporate some melee, some, some kind of weapon we haven't seen or write that she has a battalion of droids like Grievous did. And then suddenly you've evened the odds and the Knights of Ren are there and you can choreograph some really cool fights and have that be so visually interesting. Also introducing the Knights of Ren and have that intrigue there. Not only the intrigue of like the Knights of Ren, they're mysterious, they have cool outfits and they exist and do a bit more with that and actually incorporate them into the story in a way that it's like wow look aren't they cool i just feel like the movie doesn't incorporate some of these loose threads they don't grab enough of them to bring them into this main plot and like i see an opportunity here to do that and to do more you have one and this is the thing you don't have to give up a lot of time to what i'm talking about either you're just slightly changing the scenes that we have so you're not giving up a lot of the runtime of the film to incorporate more stuff <laughs> Also, a good time to mention, I like the combat. Look, I was introduced to Star Wars with the prequels. I love the prequels and I love the lightsaber fights, for example. I love the choreography. <laughs> They went a different direction with this. And and I don't mind that. I, I actually like what they went for. It's more grounded, more real. And also it feels heavier. It feels a little sluggish. Finn's not a Jedi. You know, these aren't Jedi versus Jedi. And they are returning a little bit more to the original trilogy. I, I, I like it personally. It's the resistance. Oh, I forgot about this. Or have this happen. <laughs> And this is fine. This can still happen and you can still have the Knights of Ren and like Mars and maybe a battalion of droids and you can still have some nice fight choreography and then eventually it gets decided, you know, maybe. And this is the thing. This is the thing. When you know you're going to do this and you're going to get, it's like a get out of jail free card. The resistance are going to come and sort it. You can do whatever you want. You can ramp the stakes up. You can have Finn about to die. You can have Ray about to die. You can have them battered and bruised and you can do that and you can make it like, I don't know what's going to happen here. They're losing. Oh no, wait, Finn just got a really good shot. Okay, cool. You could, you know I mean, you could do so much with the, the fight there. And I think this is a good enough excuse to do that as well, right? The resistance have been absent for so long, it makes sense that they have a bead on the situation. If anything, this makes it more viable to have the Knights of Ren come in and stack the odds a little bit more against Rey and Finn and Han and Chewie. Sorry, I'll stop it. I am, I'm just rewriting stuff at this point. And it's like, what I'm saying is what we, what we got isn't bad. It's good, it's fine, it's keeping me entertained, whatever. I just, I think you can solve some of the issues that I've talked about while also making the scenes that we got here more engaging. There he is. See, and that's cool. Now we're seeing it, man. Best pilot in the rest. Yeah. That's one hell of a pilot. Nice. And I like that. That's great. That's a great moment. But I like, so sorry. That moment there, though. I do feel like if you made a bigger meal of how good a pilot he was initially, like I was talking about Phasma coming in and having just showing off a little bit of what we just saw there in a bigger way at the beginning of the film, in a way that shows Finn how good Poe is, allows him to recognize Poe's piloting technique specifically. Perhaps even a move that he does to like elude Phasma. We see Poe do that move there. And then it's not just a thing of like, because obviously Finn thinks he's dead. It's not just a thing of like, that's one hell of a pilot. It's a thing of, wait, Poe? And there's like the, the, the shock and the, the happiness and John's a good enough actor that he can sell that. And then it's like, it's this even bigger moment of like, yeah, we as the audience are also finding out that Poe is alive too. We see him in the cockpit. Maybe you don't even show him in the cockpit until later. And, and we, we discover that with Finn that he's still alive. Do you know what I mean? Because then if we're finding out at the same time that Finn is, and you've given us that kind of physical cue that it might be Poe, right? He's made the same move or he's a really good pilot. And it makes you think, obviously, Finn's obviously verbally said Poe. Wait, then, you know, that's inserted into the audience's mind as well. He's walking up to the fighter a little later being like, is it, is it going to be him? Is it going to be him? Then Poe jumps out and like Finn finds out. And then we find out as well that that's Poe and he's alive and it just magnifies, amplifies that moment. So sorry, I am, I'm nitpicking a little bit and I am, like I say, this critique isn't me being like, that was bad. I'm just, I, I feel like it could have been, like I say, amplified if you'd done it just slightly differently. You don't have to kind of change it a great deal. You just change slight things a little bit. And I suppose this is what I'm saying is that there's nothing wrong with the way that they're telling the film. It's actually a really good first film establishing film. I just, 
I feel like they're being very safe, which I get, right? They're introducing a new Star Wars film after a decade or so. I just wish sometimes that some of these companies allowed creatives to be a little bit braver. And I think the way that they're, again, paralleling A New Hope, it's a safety net. It's like, well, we know they like that. We can't really go wrong. The worst criticism we're gonna get is that it's similar to A New Hope, but they love that. So it's fine, do you know what I mean? And I feel like that's how it played, honestly. When the film came out, I think a lot of people did have that criticism, but it was okay because it was the first film. It's the first film after a decade. They got away with it. And I think what that is, is it's the safe option. Very cool. Lovely show of power. He's very much in control. Forget the droid. We have what we need. Interesting. Finally, Kylo uh, being allowed to do something in the film. Because like up until this point, he's not done a lot. And and uniting him with Rey. Yeah, you, you start to introduce this idea of intertwining them to story-wise, which is what you've kind of got to do eventually. At least if you want to make Kylo uh, an inclusion in the franchise in the film that is more personal. Yeah, and a brilliant way to keep Finn in the mix, right? Before this, he was about to leave. Now he's not going anywhere. That's really nice organic storytelling because it gets him in a place where he's like, no, now I need to stay. Han has to stay. We have that emotional pull of that's my son. Now Han has to stick around too. It's maneuvering the plot in very organic ways, in ways that you believe, which is really good. Hello. Good. Goodness. Right, so hot take, right? I don't like C-3PO. I really don't. I've always found him a bit annoying. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know who I'm angering at this point. Probably quite a lot of people. I apologize. I know. You change your hair. Same jacket. No, oh, new jacket. <laughs> uh, look, look, I haven't come into this video to like be a party pooper. I really haven't. But at the same time, I I really don't like, I think it's feasible that Han and Leia split up. I think it's feasible. I think there are absolutely stories you could write where that's believable and, and that makes sense and, and fine. You know, people don't necessarily, that not everyone gets a happy ending. Not everything works out the way you think it should or might or could. I think the issue though, is that you've done all that off screen. So it's like the last time you saw these two together on screen, they were loved up what like married they were in love they just won a war they just find it do you know what i mean and the next time you see them on screen they're apart they've not seen each other for a while that suddenly isn't the reality and so it's like again it's this thing of it doesn't have to be a bad thing right there are absolutely scenarios in which this is natural that it would happen the issue though is that they've done it off screen and so what what it actually results in is this image that you've had of them in episode six brought through to this of ah peace good happiness awesome they what and that's not a nice feeling to me and again by the way you know look if you disagree with any of what i'm saying or you you like it for a different reason or whatever put it in the comments because i'm genuinely curious like you know at the end of the day look i i know there's a lot of vitriol that goes on in this fandom. I'm not going to have a go at you for disagreeing with me. I'm always interested in this stuff and I by no means have the definitive uh, opinion. But that's where I stand on it. Oh. Yeah, a nice moment. This is a nice moment. You completed my mission, Finn. Yeah. That's my jacket. <laughs> no, 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 no. Keep it. It suits you. Oh, they should have been boyfriends as well. I'm so sorry. Like, I know that, like, eventually, like, Oscar Isaac and John Boyega were like, yeah, well, look, we wanted it to go that way. You know, Disney be Disney. And dude, I see it. I think they play this scene good enough. And I think the actors involved are, are charismatic enough that regardless of whether they do or don't do what I was talking about, it, it still works. It absolutely still works. You must be so brave. Mm. Yeah, I do wish Chewie had been made a little bit more important, you know. That scene reminded me he existed. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's not a bad thing that they chose to tell a story with new characters. I think in a lot of ways it's limited them. The last that we heard of the chronological events of what's happening in the Star Wars universe was episode 6. Luke, Han and Leia were in a specific place and now we're coming into episode 7 we're finding out that actually they're in completely different places which again, not necessarily a bad thing but I think because it's so grandly changing to where they've ended up, to where we last saw them. And the fact that we haven't seen how they got there, I think does bring down what's happening currently with them and does make the audience feel a little bit worse off. You know, the people coming from obviously the, the originals and the prequels or whatever. I don't know. I just feel like somewhere in the writing process, you could have maybe offset that or made it a little bit less painful or just, just made that transition a little bit better, made it a little bit less starkly different because it all comes back to balancing. Okay, we've got the old audience that are going to come to a Star Wars film and then we've got the new audience that we're trying to get on board. And I think you can do both. There's definitely a valid question to be asked of how effectively this film and this trilogy has done
done that, right? And retained both, which is interesting because like I love the prequels. That was my introduction to Star Wars. When I watched the prequels, I had no idea. None of my family were nerds. I had no idea that the originals even existed when I watched the prequels. I've since gone back and watched the prequels and I will die on the hill that I love them and they're great, but I've gone back and watched them as an adult and they're not necessarily good and well put together films if i'm completely honest i love them to biz i will tell anyone that wants to listen why they're amazing but i can also outside of that acknowledge critically that the stories aren't told in the best way the way that they perhaps could have been that would have made the story they were trying to tell a bit better in my opinion of course and so like the prequels didn't do that either i think they appealed more so to the to the, the children the new audience which is what got me into star wars it absolutely worked and they very much didn't appeal at least at the time so much to the older audience that come from the originals right and so i think there's a valid question to be asked of like you can appeal to both it's harder of course it is it's possible and i think like i say you can absolutely evaluate as to how effectively they did that and i think this is in the conception phase of writing right you've got to kind of write that into it and i think the setting and the decisions they made and in, in where they were telling the story and who they were focusing on and the plot points that they've created in you know luke being somewhere he's in in exile which as an idea isn't out of field too much i mean we we know of jedi that have gone into exile for various reasons that are valid and you can understand why they did that right and you got han and leia split up and all that stuff i just think the decision making behind those things doesn't set your film up for appealing initially very well to both audiences old and new i think that honestly is a lot of the conflict that you see in the fan base when it comes to the sequels and it's the same that we got when we were at the prequels do you know what i mean so it's like i'm sure in 10 years time when people growing up on this stuff grow up you know we're going to come back and we're going to revisit them in the same way that those who have grown up now are revisiting the prequels and being like they're amazing right but you can still see the the presence and the lack of effectiveness in the way that these have been written in achieving an outcome in the film that appeals to both which is a bit of a shame if i'm honest hot take as much as i love the prequels and i prefer the prequels to the sequels but i mean you know i'm biased right i would say at least Episode seven and episode eight are better made films than the prequels are. I obviously prefer the stories in the prequels, right? And I suppose, you know, whether we go on to The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker is down to you guys. I don't know how this is gonna do. This is, honestly, I'm about three hours into recording this already and I'm, I've am i got an hour left to go. So yeah, uh, videos generally take me a long time to make just the way I make them. And it's a lot of time. So if you do like this video, if you're enjoying this video, if you've made it to this point in the video and you want more, please do share Show it some love give it a like comment i don't know do what you want to do at the end of the day i can't force you but moving on I'm trying to be helpful when did that ever help but don't say the death star <laughs> every time you look at me you're reminded of him i want him back I just never should have sent him away. Yeah, see, this is interesting. All of this stuff we're finding out. Because, sorry, I'd forgotten I had. The reason they'd split was because, I, I guess, over Ben, Kylo, and this idea of there's too much Vader in him. And this is all so interesting. I just, I kind of wish we'd seen a bit of it. Even maybe, I don't know, committed. I don't know how. And again, it's down to how you execute it. But, like, maybe we could have had some flashbacks and stuff. And again, it would have undermined maybe the, the mask and hiding his appearance. I don't think that would have mattered personally. But going back and utilizing this really interesting fall. Yeah, I, I think to a certain extent they're they're using a lot of time to focus the film on finn ray and it makes me wonder if they'd have focused even more tightly and had maybe it been ray and ben and we see flashbacks of ben as well sorry again I, you'd have to completely restructure the film to do that i just i wish they'd incorporated more of this interesting stuff that we've missed that impacts the characters we love into the film we're watching but the problem is the only way you can do that is to restructure the film and refocus the film as well we both had to deal with it in our our own way i went back to the only thing i was ever any good at we both did right and that makes sense it does make sense to be fair if luke couldn't reach him how could i you're his dad dude you're his father yeah <laughs> It's kind of interesting how quickly he just takes it off and it's like, yeah, it's my face, there we go. There are some interesting connotations to this. My favorite is that he's using the mask and the outfit as a talisman. Like a Christian would touch their crucifix for comfort, he wears the armor to keep on the path of the dark. We see later he struggles with that. He's wavering towards the light and the ease with which he takes off the helmet demonstrates to me it's more of a talisman to remind him what he chose to keep him stalwart, rather than the idea that he's just a very Vader fanboy. Makes me wish more so we had some flashbacks. Clearly wasn't that big a deal. A night? You imagine an ocean? I see it. This is a beautifully performed scene by both of them, by the way. Han Solo. I feel like he's the father you never had. He would have disappointed you. Wait, mate, don't make it personal. 
Yeah, I caught myself being like, I wish there was more that linked them at this point. I found myself inventing an idea. What I'm getting at, by the way, is that I, I don't think it needs it. I actually don't. I actually think there's enough here that's compelling. And I think they're giving such compelling performances that is selling this. And I think this is this works really, really well. What I was going to say, though, was, like I say, I don't think this is required. But you could tie the Vader thread in. And I, and I know in the concept art, there was like ideas of bringing like an Anakin Vader force ghost in. Maybe there's a reason that he didn't kill her and find the droid. More so. And you can like intrigue the audience a bit more and be like, I don't know, Vader, Anakin spoke to him and was like, don't kill her. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. That, that was where my mind went. I, I actually honestly don't feel like it needs that. I genuinely think that this makes sense as well. It's a tiny droid. It might be destroyed for all he knows. Well, she's got it in her head. Let's take her. We're, we're good. We're fine. We're done. And he's also got that personal attachment to her as well in the sense that he knows she's been hanging out with his dad and obviously he has that emotional tie there the weight that comes with that and that relationship and, and the problems with that he has a fascination with her a little bit because of that as well do you know what i mean which, which organically really really works and, and ties them together enough you know not a lot's happening on screen He's just holding a hand to her head. They're vying force-wise, but like they're selling it. They're beautifully You're showing afraid. all of the little intricate details on their face of how they're doing in this fight that you can't see. She is strong with the force. Untrained. Ren believed it was no longer. I love how Ren counsels his demeanor here to be more in control around Hux. You will remove these restraints and leave this cell with the door open. Yeah, I wish, you know. Sorry, because I caught myself thinking about this moment and I, I know that it's a point of contention with people of like, how does she know how to do that? How, she, how can she do that? All of a sudden, it comes back to the Mary Sue thing. And I can't help but like part of me does agree with that. I, I will be honest, like part of me. There was like, because I, I have subtitles on, there was a moment in Maz Kanata's castle where Ben Kenobi, Force Ghost Kenobi, said Ray's name. And actually, like obviously we saw in A New Hope the prequels as well that Kenobi had a really strong affinity with force manipulation right and you know in the sense of influencing minds right and I kind of wish she had a voice in her head do you know what I mean that's the way you could tie Kylo and Rey and have some symmetry between them actually have Kylo like they both have voices in their heads and it's funny that I say that because I know that's kind of where we get to eventually and that you know Kylo has always, always had this voice in his head right but I'm not talking about like Snoke or Palpatine or whatever I'm talking about like Anakin Vader and, and actually maybe more so Vader honestly but the reason obviously they can they can talk is because Anakin has manifested himself as a force ghost but perhaps there's some hokey force stuff of like yeah okay he was taught to manifest himself as a force ghost but because he was so split in life there is an element of Vader that does still exist in him right and so but perhaps there's like a shard of Vader communicating with Kylo and maybe later on we find out Anakin force ghost Anakin is like yeah I'm, I'm sorry that that's just a part of me I'd, I had no control over it and and this is new to me do you know like just something that I'm getting too specific but basically what I'm saying is a voice in Kyra's head and equally we've already established that there's like an element of Ben Kenobi perhaps force ghost wise maybe talking to Ray already have him talking to her here perhaps not manifesting himself particularly but just the voice of being like look let me teach you something try this and then suddenly the force suggestion that she tries in a second maybe makes sense. And you're also at the same time intertwining her and Kylo in a way that like there is symmetry there. Right? And it's light and dark in an interesting way as well, because you're seeing obviously Vader, which I think a lot of the audience want to see that. And also you're just helping out like the newer audience be like, who's Vader? Who is Vader? Let me go back and watch maybe the, the films they hadn't seen. And so I, I just feel like the, the, everyone wins. You know what I mean? If, if, if you kind of incorporate that kind of thing into it. And by the way, the only reason I'm trying to kind of incorporate it into it is because like for me personally, as much as I try and finagle this moment and I want to wash over it and be like, it's fine. She can just force suggest him she gets out whatever i'm sorry i can't take myself out of like i guess the knowledge that i i have and have been working with with like the expanded universe and the, the animated shows and blah 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 and, and and like i do feel like force suggestion isn't just something you can do i understand why they did it though and i don't think it's trying to make her more powerful than she is i just think the association that is being made is that force suggestion is associated with the light side and that's what they're trying to achieve that's what they're trying to show you that she is a light side force user and that is where we're going with that and like look some force users before they are actually 
naturally indoctrinated into the Jedi Order do exhibit specific force powers that they just have innately. So you could absolutely argue it from that point of view as well. Honestly, it's not a groundbreaking, earth-shattering thing that takes me out of it. There is like a voice in my head, ironically, that feels that like there, there should be a little bit more, maybe. And even if it is innate, explain that, right? Have her do it more often. Have her maybe do it at the beginning when she's on Jakku and she tries to get something that's really innocent. You have a character being like, no, stop, get off me. And, and she says something like very pointedly, but there's no other indication she's using the force and then suddenly the person changes their mind. And then you've explained that it's like an innate ability. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm getting too into it, but like, look, look, man, I, I enjoy Star Wars and, and, and sorry, that's how I think about it. It doesn't ruin it for me. I wish there was more. <laughs> I love this though. I love that moment. It's so real, man. Again, really cool visuals. Our system is the next target. If we can destroy that oscillator. <laughs> I can do it. I like this guy. <laughs> Beautiful. I've always hated watching you leave. For his bottom. Fair enough, eh? Some things never change. They still drive me crazy. See, this is nice. And it does give me the impression that, like, they haven't necessarily been split for a very long time. It was just when Kylo turned that they had difficulties, which still leaves quite a big amount of time where they were together, they were happy. So I think this scene does go a long way to actually, at least for me, acting as a balm for that. Bring him home. We're making our landing approach at light speed. Of course you are. All right, sure you get ready. Makes sense. Yeah, good. No! Beautiful. It almost doesn't matter that the plot is the same as A New Hope because this is fun and the visuals are on point. The ride is enjoyable. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean it couldn't have been better if they'd have, like I've said, been braver, but it doesn't mean that what's here isn't good. What was your job when you were based here? Sanitation. Beautiful. <laughs> His face. People are counting on us. The galaxy is counting on us. We'll use the force. <laughs> That's not how the force works. <laughs> I remember in the cinema that getting out like a big laugh. And I think really nice uh, in the way that it manipulates these two characters. And we see that actually Finn doesn't care. I think he does, but I think he's just there for Ray. It makes Han put that cloak of responsibility on again. And it's like suddenly he's back. And it's nice because it's like it returns that character progress that it feels like we lost in the way that it went in how we were introduced to Han in this film. That regression that I was talking about. This moment here is like a redonning of that and actually it's like oh he he is Han again sorry I'm watching this live so like I haven't planned there's no script for this video I've never actually done any script for any of my videos just so it explains a lot and actually that moment there makes me feel a lot better about Han in the same way that the last scene between Han and Leia actually made me feel a lot better about their their relationship and what we didn't see I still think that there's an element of me that's like I wish we'd seen a bit of that but at the same time I do think they account for it and I think it just depends on each individual person as to whether that's enough for you. And that's that's absolutely subjective. Hey. Beautiful. <laughs> I should not be laughing so much at like death, to be honest. And I'm in charge. I'm in charge now, Phasma. <laughs> I do maintain it's still a crime how underutilized Phasma is. Even if we just got her at the beginning pursuing Poe, that might have been enough. It depends how you go on and have her incorporated into the next film or the next film, but uh, just a little more, right? And there is room for her in this film to be shown a little bit more. Even when you're at Mask and Art's Castle, I'm talking about Knights of Ren being there. Maybe she's there too. Uh, maybe that's too much at that point. But do you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's points in the film where she can be more incorporated. <laughs> I like how we're seeing that she has literally trained for this. We open with her scaling the insides of Star Destroyers. Hit the target dead center as many runs as we can get. Yeah, and it's like, I wish I was more connected to Poe at this point. Because it's like, you think about his inclusion in the film and he's really only been this character. Sure, he's had that kind of like Han Solo flair of like, you know, at the beginning with Kylo, his wisecracking, that kind of thing. But other than that, he's just been the pilot. He is the best pilot ever in the Resistance, whatever. Which is fine and that's cool. But that is all we've seen of him when you've got Oscar Isaac, you hired Oscar Isaac and his interactions with Finn are also good, right? And it's like, and, and again, meta, but I know how he interacts as the trio with Rey and Finn in The Rise of Skywalker. That's one of my critiques of that film, I remember, was that they had gold dust with those three and they haven't utilized it. And so it's like, I feel like at this point in the, the film, I want to be more emotionally attached to him, but I honestly don't feel that attached to him. Him. But as long as there's light, we got a chance. Very symbolic. Why are you doing that? Hmm? <laughs> 
trying to come up with a plan. <laughs> How did you get away? Yeah, I feel like even if they'd had it so she'd maybe force unlocked her restraints and then just whacked the guy, still would have worked. And to me, would have just smoothed over, yeah, the slight difficulty that I think you raise with with how it went down and their weapon will be fully charged in 10 minutes yeah guys you should have evacuated let's be honest with ourselves as soon as you know they were charging up for a blast just get some ships dude i should also say by the way like because i i'm making a lot of additions to the story and and whatever and like i'm coming from a place of knowledge of okay i know that people didn't like this i know that people didn't like this i know that people maybe liked this but didn't like it for that so it's easy for me to go back and go through it and kind of talk about well you could fix that criticism by changing it slightly like this this. When you're like writing something, you don't have any of that information, right? So it's like, I do appreciate and I don't want to come across as being like, well, I know better because it's not, that's not what I'm doing. It, there's a reason it's called critique and not writing or rewriting because those, those two things are very different. So anything that I say isn't kind of coming in and directly criticizing the writers because at the end of the day they weren't writing this to make people unhappy <laughs> like that's not why you write things and they're not necessarily thinking of well oh well that section of the fan base wants that and that section of the fan base is going to think that towards that they're going to be like well this is kind of cool to me uh, i'm also thinking about putting the story together because of that and that and that and that and also you can get so far into it that you just get so blind to perhaps how people are going to receive something right that's just how writing works i just want to kind of communicate that like i i appreciate that and i and i know that like it's not me kind of being like well if i'd have written them that'd have been amazing and the only reason i can perhaps give the illusion that i could have written it better is because i'm almost rewriting it as i'm watching it because i know the, the criticisms that people have come at it with and not liked it for right which you can never have when you're writing something you can't i think you can ensure yourself against it i i, I do i do genuinely min maintain the biggest weakness to me and the thing that i think promotes a lot of cracks in the story from what i remember i mean this is the only one that i've kind of critiqued as much as i have is that they didn't plan a trilogy they were like okay you write this one you write this one you write this one you direct that one you direct that one you direct that one with no cohesion i still maintain that whoever made that decision that blows my mind that's silly that's really really silly and it's not that that can't work out and i'm not saying that hasn't worked out i, I know there are people that like the sequels right and that's fine and that's fair good you know i'm never going to have a go at someone for liking something right but what i am saying is that you can prevent your work of writing of art of movies from coming under fire from more people if you put more planning into it and think about it more and I think because we know that it wasn't planned as a three story arc three movie arc that does demonstrate there's a limited amount of thought that went into it into appealing to the maximum amount of people that's what I think is going on here that's what I'd say with confidence is going on here and that's not down to the writers right that's the writers been given a bad stick of like, okay, well, I'm, I'm commissioned to write this one. I don't know where they're going to go with the next one. All I can do is perhaps be a bit kinder and leave it open for them. As a writer, I can understand that perspective. And then obviously coming in perhaps with The Last Jedi and having to deal with what came before and wanting to tell your story, but perhaps you want to tell it in a way or, or it requires such that you have to perhaps change things from the thing that came before because you didn't write that. You didn't plan for that. So I just want to be clear, like I'm not having to go at individual writers here. There's a lot more going on than just that again beautiful shot beautiful shot your son he's gone he was weak and foolish like his father so i destroyed him i love how he plays kylo because he does sound whiny he does sound naive he does sound like someone playing at vader which doesn't make him less dangerous if anything it makes him more dangerous it's too late no it's not yeah it's never too late dude i miss you Beautiful how you see that as well, that he wants to. Like, Adam, smash that. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. I love how they switch this, by the way. The way he's talking, because you think he's talking about the strength to let go of the dark side, and what obviously he's actually talking about is the strength to kill his father. It's such a beautiful, like, full props to the writers for that. That's beautiful. It also, by the way, it would be remiss of me to say, I had this spoiled for me. I'm so angry. Like, I'm still angry to this day. I was working in Leicester at the time. I was working, I had some work 
work experience at a newspaper. I was on my lunch break and I was scrolling Instagram maybe, and I went to a comment section, completely unrelated to Star Wars. It was my fault, it had come out. Like, I, I think I was seeing it later that day and I just should have been off social media. It's, I say it's kind of my fault, but it, it wasn't. Someone, some idiot put like a screenshot and then literally text. I'm sorry, there's no reason for me to mention this. You can see I'm still bothered by it, right? It haunts me, it does. So it's so sad because I actually don't know how I'd have felt. I didn't know until I watched the film whether it was a spoiler or not, but when it happened, I was mad because I was like, it did spoil it. And I can never experience that like fresh, true. Sorry, anyway, moving on. Will you help me? Yes, anything. Yeah, and of course he'd say, yes, I'll help you. This is such a beautiful scene because Han thinks he's handing it. <laughs> Mate, my heart still went. They played that perfectly. The pause, and then the sound design on it, the way that Han reacted. Thank you. Got the horror on Han's face as he realizes how he misinterpreted it. That's so, oh mate, that's the best part of this film. Like honestly, and look at that, still the care. Even despite, he's like, I love you still. And also probably despair at, oh God, how far you've fallen. Do you know what I mean? There's so much happening, so much packed in that moment. And that is honestly the piece de resistance of this film, genuinely. And I, and I, and so I get why, for example, as well, like, cause that's where the stuff was coming from of Ray striking up a relationship with Han because, you know, they knew they were building up to this and they wanted to give Ray an, an emotional attachment to Han that she wouldn't ordinarily have had. So she can go now on into the next film and have beef, big beef with Kylo in a way that obviously I mean, you know, that's already established in the film anyway, because, you know, he's tortured her, right? Like, that still is there, but it's so deep now. This is beautiful and done so, so well. This is why I mentioned that I got spoiled, because I genuinely don't know if I'd have been fooled by it, because I, I didn't have that opportunity. But the way that they wrote it and the way that they flipped it and the way that uh, Han doesn't realize the way that he's talking means something else. I think they do write it into it so perfectly that you don't quite know until he does it, what Kylo's about to do. Let me know in the comments, did, did that get you? Did that fool you? Did you not see it coming? Did it shock you? And again, look at this shot that we're paused on. It's beautiful and, and beautiful in the colors, right? The red Sith dark side versus the white blue of light, the light side, the representations there of where, you know, Kylo rests and where Han was at the end. Beautiful, beautiful moment. Like you can't, I can't fault that at all. <laughs> Valid. I'm not gonna make a big deal out of this because I've made a big deal out of everything. <laughs> Chewie's shot and the fact that like Kylo can still move. I think it's just reflective of how powerful, how centered Kylo is. And it's still painful, right? And that still accounts for what happens in the fight to come and how he can't quite hold his own, but still does. How did he get there? Can I just ask though? Yeah, he's hurt. Oof. Bro, why did you throw the blaster though? That was dumb. Traitor! That yell, I can't help. I can't help but wish that there'd been more seeded in regard to Finn and Kylo's relationship, you know? We saw at the beginning that they were obviously, they're on the same team. You know, maybe we had a thing of like, maybe he was like, I don't know, they had a connection, they were friends, or you know, Finn was one of Kylo's personal guard, something like that. And then that, that yell of traitor, cause that seems a little out of place to me, right? It seems too personal. I'm like, there's no personal that kind of exists. Like there's a little bit, sure. I can kind of see where it came from, but I don't feel it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Finn's on the defensive, right? And we know that he's had a certain level of melee combat training, being trained as a stormtrooper, and they have those shock batons. Yeah, look, he's on the back foot at all times. And the way they've choreographed this fight makes absolute sense for where these characters are and, and how proficient they are, truthfully, and also accounting for Kylo's injury. Yeah, Kylo's a little lazy. Not lazy, but right. <laughs> But slow, he's a bit slow. He got hit and then aggressively lashed out and boom, Finn's down, right? It's worth mentioning that Rey is on the back foot a lot too. I also think Kylo emotionally is in a place of vulnerability. He just killed his father. As much as he tries to talk a big game, I think we know he's not doing well with that. We know later he turns to the light after all. We see with Finn, Kylo has him down and turns away to reset. He was toying with Finn, missteps, gets hurt, then finishes the fight quickly. I think because of this place of vulnerability he's in results in him wanting to prove to himself still that he 
he's the big bad Sith, because I think he still feels sorrow even now at Han's death. He wants to lord it over Finn and Rey. He's playing with his food when he really shouldn't be. He's not in fighting shape. I think the emotional state he's in right now goes a lot of the way to explaining the beats of these fights and account for how it seems Kylo struggles. I think he is, but I think the larger part of it is his vulnerability coming out to overcompensate. He has to humiliate them, not just beat them, and he can't. <laughs> Yeah, and I think with her melee proficiency, the brawler-esque that she's got. You need a teacher! Right. And also the force sensitivity, the raw natural force affinity that she's got. I think this makes sense. This is fine. Like, I, I remember watching this and not thinking more on it, honestly. And re-watching it with, obviously, the, the criticisms that I know exist. This is fine. Sorry, I do feel like a lot of people are making a lot of noise over nothing here. <laughs> Yeah, and sorry, but he is weakened. He's tired, he's hurting. Fighting aggressively against him is a gambit that could work and I think is probably the best shot you have and she's doing that. That's what's giving her the advantage here. Right, it opens herself up as well, but... Beautiful callback, by the way, to Obi-Wan Anakin at Mustafar. The way they grab their wrists like that, man, that traumatized me. Let's not go over it. Oof. Don't get me wrong, I think it's absolutely on purpose that he should be embarrassed that he lost to Rey there in himself, but he overexerted himself and he picked a fight that he shouldn't have when he was like really injured. Not only that, because of that, he let himself get injured by Finn before he even fought Rey, right? <laughs> Again, the visuals, beautiful, man. I think for when this came out and what they were trying to achieve, I think it's a triumph. I think they achieved what they set out to do. And as much as it absolutely didn't please everybody, I think it did what it needed and set up a new trilogy, truthfully. As much as there are issues, and I think there are things that, you know, you can look at it and say, okay, well, maybe they should have done this a little bit differently, right? I spent the whole film doing that. I think what they actually do with it and the story they tell and what they set up, it's a good isolated film on its own. It could have been braver. It could have been less safe. It could have had less parallels with A New Hope. But at the same time, again, there's enough value, I think, in this film that I can watch it and enjoy it, right? Yeah, and the hug as well. I know, I know everyone's like, she should have hugged Chewbacca, and I don't think it would have hurt if that had been the way they went, right? I'm absolutely inserting some finagling into the logic of this, but Leia's force sensitive. She knows how people are feeling. Rey's a lot younger. She can feel that. And in the moment, realizing that actually maybe Rey needed it more, Leia would have known that. And that's why she did that, right? Or that could have be a, a reason for why she did that. How dare you call me that? <laughs> like I talk about like not liking C-3PO but I think what makes them good is that R2 just picks fun at him like that's what I enjoy <laughs> maybe says more about me how I missed you that seems a little contrived you know he woke up just when they needed it may the force be with you Oh, has she got the, the buns back again? Because, like, Han was like, you changed your hair. She's got the buns back, maybe in honour, perhaps, of Han. I do feel a little bit like we gloss over Han's death, you know. It's a nice touch that she has the staff from Jakku, actually. There has been an element of her fearing the Force and her powers and being confused. And it also links her, it's been kind of established that it links her to Kylo. Any way that she's experienced the Force has come kind of as a result of her meeting Kylo and, and interacting with him, which isn't pleasant for her, right? It's not something that comes without trauma. Yeah, maintaining this idea of the familiar, something also that links her to home, says a lot that she's chosen that to carry and shows her state of mind as well and where she is when she's here and she's meeting luke right yeah there he is i wish we'd got a bit more of him but that's me being greedy that is me being greedy and i am just talking about like flashbacks right if we'd have got some flashbacks maybe with ben there's no room for that in the film that we got but hmm it's a really nice moment i mean beautiful shot but there we go, that was The Force Awakens, what do I think ultimately? Coming to the close, I think that idea of having a bowl of soup and this feeling of getting plate upon plate of these appetizing meals and just getting a bite of them. Always having this soup in front of me and enjoying it and it's doing its thing and like it's doing what it needs to do, I'm getting sated, right? But all of these things that it's teasing me with and I'm getting bites and I'm like, oh, that's so good, bring it back, no, 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 come back, you know, and, and I think that's kind of the perfect metaphor for how I feel about the film.
film because I enjoyed the film. There are problems with it in the sense of, okay, this could have been achieved better. But I think when you're talking about, okay, what's the goal? We're going to ignite a, a trilogy of Star Wars, right? The first film, we're going to establish new characters. We're going to obviously incorporate Han, Leia, Luke. How do we do that? I think it achieves its goal. I, I do think it achieves its goal. Obviously, you know, people hearing me say that are going to be like, yeah, sure, it achieved it. At what cost? You dramatic, you. Because, um, <laughs> like, some people aren't going to be obviously happy with how they achieved it, right? Absolutely. And that's the point. But what I'm saying is that I think they achieved it in such a way that there's enough good in there that actually The Force Awakens is a good beginning. I think the cracks that the trilogy, at least to me, falls prey to start here. You, like, you can kind of see it here in the way that like the writing is leaving as much open as possible, which, like I say, I think has a good effect. It makes you ask questions. It, it engages you. It intrigues you. It absolutely achieves that, which is really important. But at the same time, it goes too far over the line, at least for me. It asks too many questions. It makes you ask too many questions. It doesn't tell you quite enough about what's happening and almost feels like it's skips too much to get to the point that it's at. Now, um, with that said, and that obviously acknowledged, does that mean that I, like I say, didn't enjoy the film? I think The Force Awakens is good. I can watch it. I can have a good time. I think they introduce Finn, Ray, and I think they introduce Poe really, really well. And I think Ray and Finn, and I think Kylo in the end, he's, he's slower to take off, but I think those three really are given a lot of care in this and they're established as who they are. They go on nice journeys from start to end. And I think they have really good first films. Poe, I think, is established really well and isn't utilized as much as he could be. I think he becomes one note. But I think it does a real, really good job of a starting a narrative that I think it does, you know, tell a start, it tells a middle, and it tells a finish. I think the way that it's constructed leaves a little bit to be desired for me, but it doesn't make it a bad film. And to give you a bit of an insight how I feel about the sequels individually, I remember liking The Force Awakens a lot. The Last Jedi, I actually saw twice in the cinema, and I don't think I've ever seen it again truthfully. But I enjoyed it. I think the cracks that come really, you see in The Rise of Skywalker, start in The Last Jedi. However, I think The Last Jedi, isolated as a film, is actually enjoyable. I think in the larger, again, it comes back to this debate of like, in the larger universe of Star Wars films, I don't necessarily think this, The Last Jedi meshes very cohesively. But I think what some of what they do in that film is actually really good. And look, you know, again, if you like this video, like, comment, let me know if you want The Last Jedi and I'll go on and do that. And, and maybe I'll see more. I mean, I honestly, having watched this, I've seen more and have come to a, a, a more definitive conclusion of how I feel about it. I'll be honest with you, The Rise of Skywalker, I really despise. There was one thing that really, really angered me in The Rise of Skywalker, and I'm actually kind of curious to watch that with a critical eye, more of a critical eye and go through it step by step and kind of tear that apart a little bit. And I, I know that I've critiqued this film and torn it apart a little bit, maybe to a degree that you might say is a bit too much fair enough um so i'm kind of curious to revisit those two films and see if i still agree with those um conclusions and to see if there's anything more that i see on the rewatch and, and and have to add um anyway that's the end of the video thank you so 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 much for watching um there's early access uh, down below in the description if you like my work want to support me if not hey subscribe tick that bell button you'll be notified every single time i upload i cover a bunch of shows if you like this go have a look see if anything interests you i've got patreon youtube memberships so they're both the same you get some badges and stuff over here on youtube but otherwise there's three tiers thank you genuinely to those who do support me thank you honestly you make a huge difference and make this um so much more viable as something that i can do so um yeah genuinely thank you for your support and if anyone wants to test my metal as a writer there are also some links down below in the description i've written some novellas if you're interested uh have a quick look down there but other than that thank you so much for watching it's been a long one and I hope you've enjoyed. I'll see you soon.